I've had a chance to sleep on the decision making about my construction in the roof of this building and uh, the, the day before yesterday I didn't I wasn't on the building site yesterday I had some other things to do so I'm back here today but the last thing I did or the last day I was here was that Monday was um, sort out these two nice pieces of wood to use as what's called the Merns Ors. Murna, I've, I've, I've scrapped, uh, written on them. And I'm going to work a bit with that today. I've had a chance to sleep on the matter and I know what I'm going to do now. I haven't actually pulled out these pieces of timber yet, so I'm not quite sure exactly how good they are. So let's find out now. When I'm working with these big timbers, I want to try and, uh, I don't want to try and lift them as a dead weight. So I get something like a balance point like that. And the more that hangs over the end, the lighter the other part is. It's just ways of conserving a bit of energy. Now the two pieces that I have to find now, uh, they have to meet and be able to be joined together and they have to stick out the side of the building at least 50 centimetres, maybe a bit more. I'll let them stick out as much as I can, I can cut them later. Oh, I'm shouting right next to the camera. The ones that are here, that I've already done stick out a bit further at this end because this is where the rain comes from so I don't know if I'm going to do that or not but there is at least the option of having the gable roof overhang be slightly wider at this end of the building. I probably won't do that, I'll probably have it the same as at the other end but it's always nice to have the option and if the wood's long enough I'll wait until later before I cut it, of course. I got a bit hot clearing the snow. It's not that cold today actually, it's, it's just below freezing. I don't want to get sweaty, that's cardinal sin. It's guaranteed to catch cold if you get sweaty, really. We we'll start working with the marking and stuff. That's will work without much exercise so it will get very cold. Oh this bit looks like it's too short. Oh, that's a shame because that's a really nice quality piece that. Maybe I'll use that one as one of the standing posts. I need to make those as well. The ones on the carport side. If you go back and look at that previous film where there is uh, the image it's the standing posters that have room braces on them. Those are the ones. I haven't made those yet either. I haven't, I've got some granite to use as a foundation laid in the ground with a, a concrete beam that's been... has rebar in it. That's what it's called, isn't it? Rebar. To spread the weight. And then on top of those, I'm going to put a couple of granite blocks, which I might drill. I drill into the rebar, or into the concrete beam, and I'll drill into the granite, and I'll put a pin, just to keep them stable in a direction. I won't screw them fixed, or it doesn't need to be fixed, it's just as long as it's not allowed to skid out. If the building gets hit by a tractor, for example, when it's clearing snow, just a little bit is enough to knock it out, so it just needs to be something to stop that from happening. Obviously, if a tractor hits it hard, the wood will split anyway. So, always I'm trying to search for a paucity of means. The minimum to do exactly the job that I'm trying to make it do. 
Well, I'll say that, and then there's, I'm surrounded by giant timber, really. This building could have easily been made in 5 by 5 inch, 125, 125, instead of the 150, 6 inch by 6 inch that I've used. So it's dimension for a bigger building, really, but it leaves the options open for later if the customer would like to turn this building into something other than the garage and they've got a very good building to get going with. It's a nice cavity in the wall there that could be well it could be insulated. A, a wood fibre insulation for example then you wouldn't need to have a lot of the modern systems you know the airing and everything you don't really need that with, a, with that uh, wood fibre insulation. At least not not for a workshop or something. Well, maybe that one is longer. I'm train of thought. I've got to get my train of thought back into the work now. Not quite shiny. Let's see if that is long enough. Might be. They don't need to be, the join of these two beams doesn't need to be massive because it doesn't take very much, it's not going to take very much load. All right, that's already up at 60 centimetres, so that's plenty. I think I did, as I said, I took 70 on these ones. I might try and see if I can get away with 70. bit of darker coloured wood here it might be the beginning of some rot but I can get rid of that where the two pieces are joined together. Right we're over 50 there so that's great. Okay so my two favoured pieces of wood are going to go well for that. I think this actually might be a purlin. <laughs> Just even if there were the very beginnings of a bit of rot here, I wouldn't be worried about it here inside the house where it's under a roof all the way. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't continue to rot. Can always let a little bit go. well over an inch to spare in the way of strength. There's, these are over dimensions for the job, these things. It's Scandinavia, you're really paying for the labour. The labour's very expensive. The materials actually aren't that expensive. In fact, these pieces of well, this one's eight centimetres, it's supposed to be 75. 75 by 150, three by six. They weren't much cheaper than the, than the box because they have to be cut. They have to be cut the same amount and that's what you're paying for, the cutting more than the material. That just simply might not be the case in other areas. There are lots of places where labor is cheaper. The materials are more expensive. Based on the materials I have here, this is a medium quality piece. There are a fair few knots in it. I'm going to use it as the bottom part of this box, box section. It doesn't take very much load. It's almost just really a kind of, has a tying function, tying the building together. Could be done with a piece of timber at least half the size, if not smaller. But I don't want to use this piece that has slightly uneven has slightly uneven year growth. I don't want to use it as a standing beam that's outdoors. Actually a very nice 
nice piece of timber that. I've been saving the good pieces to last and now it doesn't need to be such a good piece of timber for this job really. I just haven't got any bad ones left. So I'm going to mark that top. So this piece of timber is called F3 because it's wall F. That's in shot. Yeah. It's called F3 because it's the third piece of timber up in height going that way on the F wall. I've numbered this house in a very particular way. It's something I've brought with me from doing log houses. And when you number a log house, you start on perhaps the left wall when you walk in the front door. So in this building, I can't remember which way it is now, if that's the A wall. Yeah. I just wanted to check that because I don't want to have to re-edit it. So the way I've done it is, this time is that the A wall is the gable end with the door openings. The B wall is on my left hand side. So it's A, B, the other gable is C, the small dividing wall is D. No, the, the, uh, the wall that joins the two, where the, the existing building is, that goes out into the carport, is the D wall. And the E wall is this dividing wall, and the F wall is the last one. So I just go around the building, A, B, C, D, E, F. And then in height, the first one is, for example, B1 on that side down at the bottom. That's the bottom plate. B2 is the top plate. And if there were any further up, I would carry on with the numbers. There aren't there. In the middle here, it's the F wall. So F1 is the bottom plate. F2 is the top plate. F3 is this piece, the piece that goes at the bottom of this um, gitter, um, kind of box shape that I'm making. It's like a, it's really like a big strength and beam, but that's I don't know the words for it. I'm sorry. Anyway, this one's the F because it's F3 because it's the third one up in height, and then the one on top, the one that I started off with today is the that's called the Mörns Ors in Norwegian. I mean in lofting anyway, in, in uh, timber houses it's called the Mernsos. Also... I don't know about timber framing. Oh, I think there might be purlins in English, the, top, the kind of top purlin, it might be, it's probably got a special name, you have to help me out. Anyway that's F4. And then when the pieces are in two parts, like they are on this long wall in the middle, it's F4A and F4B. And the A and, you know, the first letter I do in capitalisation, and the second one I'll do in cursive, in small letters. If that's a better word. I don't know what the name for that is either. So this one is F3B. I might do a dedicated video on marking buildings because it's very useful. It's a very useful piece of knowledge to know. In fact, I might even do that one in Norwegian because a lot of my customers have had buildings that have been very poorly marked and it makes it very difficult if you take down an old building and don't mark it correctly. So it's very good to use a routine that's logical and that a lot of other builders use. And uh, this is one that um, the colleagues of mine and myself have used for several years. And I think it's, um, I think it's quite widespread in Norway to do it like this. So um, I'll do a dedicated video for that. I've cut the first of the standing posts that stand within the gable. This is the second one make them the same length. I was quite careful when I measured them, they were 100 and, it's 140 centimetres. When I use another piece to mark, to mark a line like this, the line always comes on the outside of the other piece, it's longer. So I, I have to cut the line off really for them to be identical length. You might wonder sometimes why I leave the line and sometimes why I cut it off and that could be one of the reasons.
it's nice this timber, it's nicely cut square. Whoever cut this has got a nice sawmill. Look at that, they meet when I put the square around. That's not often the case actually with this timber. Very nice. Noted it once in an earlier video that you should watch when you, if you can see when the chainsaw cuts like that. I have an opportunity with the top edge of the saw to make a second cut. So if I've left too much of the line, if I've left too much of the line, I can take a, a second swipe at it, so to speak. I said before that I've tried doing this with a circle saw. I've seen a few other builders that build these kind of houses use circle saws and then saw off the bit that the circle saw doesn't reach. This is six inch timber, so I don't have a circle saw that goes any deeper than uh, about five and a half or six centimeters, which means there would be a square that isn't cut in the middle. So you have to do that with a hand saw and then it has to be dressed anyway with a plane. So, and then also I found that if the square, if the timber isn't perfectly square, the cut very often don't meet each other. There's often a little bit of discrepancy. Also, if your saw isn't set up perfectly, it won't do it. So this, I find both fast and accurate in relation to the work that I'm doing. I mean, obviously it isn't absolutely accurate, but it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. So, the reason why I go from both sides is to do with accuracy. And then I just plane from the outside in, so as not to split out the wood. Feels quite good. It's probably not in camera shot as usual. Okay, that's it's perfect in that direction, and in that direction, it's less than half a millimeter inaccurate. It's certainly, it's certainly pretty good. Good enough for this. I'm faffing around now because it's filming. I would have just stopped and let that go. These pieces stand vertically in the building and the horizontal part marries with that. I have to make two of those. Which end is best here? There are more knots here. left here. So I'm going to make make the cut at this end. So when the screws sit in the woodwork there's plenty of strength. Get my key. Cut away the wet bit. See how those wet fibers don't pick up the image very well. 
Look at the ice. This is 15 and a half. I've checked the I've checked the one that it's going to marry with, and that is also 15 and a half. Double check. Yeah, exactly 15 and a half. They're going to shrink a little bit. So, but I'm going to do it 15 and a half. I don't really need to do the half bit on both sides because I can cut all of that from one position with the chainsaw. Camera's in a bit in the way, so I'm doing it a bit cack handed. Very good. I won't even bother with the. They're going to be screwed together. It's going to be another piece that goes that way. And then they'll be screwed together. I could have put, uh, put done this at an angle so that it hooks, but I, I don't need to. I'm trying to save time. It, the screws will do the job. F3A mark top. It's this piece here I want to get rid of. Just mark that at once so I don't make a mistake. Enough space to cut off the not very good bit.
I'm glad that, uh, well that's well out. Oh, so is that. That's because, you say, the beam has not been cut square. Look at that. That's a big difference, isn't it? Luckily for this, it uh, has, no, has no consequence because this is a vertical, this piece stands vertically in the building. So I'm not worried about that. But it does mean I have to recut this because that certainly isn't square. That's a challenge, really, because... Cutting small amounts off are a bit difficult with the chainsaw. I think I might just use the axe actually. It shows you just how much more time consuming it is when things are slightly wrong. So for all of you who want to start building, for example, having your own sawmill, I wouldn't buy timber from you if you had your own sawmill unless you've had some years experience to be honest because it's you just make it's too easy to make mistakes. I've tried done a few hours running sawmills and uh, I'm not gonna do it with the yeah, axe after all this. It's too, too small, it's a small amount. Difficult. Oh, as I was saying. It's really helpful if everything is accurate. All along the supply chain. You just, you, on the whole, this, this delivery of timber has been very, very good. But there's no good reason for that to be bad. This is a very loose grown piece of timber. Uh, it should have been better than that. Presumably something went wrong with the saw blade. That's better now. I'm only doing this because it's on camera. Well, I suppose it's good to have a proof of concept. To be honest, I'm quite confident. Acid test. Oh, 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 oh not bad. Oh, that's, that's very good. If you wanted it to be totally perfect, you could saw through with a handsaw there. But if you do that, you have to make sure that it's where you want it to be. Now it's perfectly aligned with the set square. Have a quick look with the Timberman square as well, the longer one. 
I don't think it really makes any difference. If it's right with the set square, it's right. Yeah, it's really perfect, that. That's perfectly aligned. So, with everything else, if everything else is correct, when I put the building together, pointing at it. Here the beam is about a millimetre below the end of that, at least here it, it is. And that's a good thing because when this dries out it's going to shrink a little bit but it won't shrink in that direction. It might shrink actually to about two millimetres. No, oh, but this one's the one that's not square, isn't it? So I, I can't really check it like that. Oh well. It's very, it's very similar. I'd just like to do two or three hours work uninterrupted. So I hope that was of interest, the little bit today maybe makes a little bit more sense of some of the stuff that I've been showing you earlier on which was a bit garbled. I apologise for being a bit garbled. Probably do a lot too much talking.